whether it's ideas from the, the far left, the far right, from uh, jihadi Islamist circles which have borrowed from these, there's a framing of a grand conspiracy in which you are the victim. We have to change the system by fighting back. We need a revolution. Western militaries had a series of tactical successes and strategic failure. So Afghanistan is one massive series of considerable tactical successes and overall strategic failure. So I think trying to work and establish trust and contact with, with movement leaders where there is a movement and there's a leadership, recognizing legitimate grievances, legitimate causes, making the argument strongly that, you know, it's, your beliefs are fine. In fact, you know, we may even agree that they're very good beliefs, but methods of violence are not going to work. Methods of hate, incitement of hatred are not going to work. Uh, globally, I think the rise of the far right has to do with the rise of a, a different but related thing, which is authoritarian populism. Hello, everyone. This is Maz. Well, here we are, the first episode of 2023. I hope you've had a nice break, and I wish you all the best for the year ahead. Thank you for joining me for another year of the Voices of War, and I look forward to sharing many more interesting and insightful discussions with you. I would also like to remind you about the upcoming change to the Voices of War. From February onwards, subscribers to the show will have access to a separate feed, which will air full episodes. This channel will publish the first half of each episode, and each episode will be bookended with an invitation to become a subscriber. I recently published a short explanation of this change, and you can find a link to that at the top of the show notes. Those wishing to subscribe can already do so via the link also in the show notes. Okay, now let's get to the next episode with Professor Greg Barton, which is a deep dive into the complex topic of radicalization, extremism, and terrorism. Greg helps us first define these terms before explaining some of the factors that motivate groups and individuals down this path. We discuss the process of radicalization, the dangers of online recruitment, the scaling of this problem through social media, the effectiveness of counterterrorism measures, the growing threat of far-right extremism, and a whole lot more. We conclude with a pragmatic reflection on the current state and dangers to democracy in the United States. As you'll hear, Greg is an eminent expert in the field, and I hope you get as much out of this discussion as I have. Lastly, this episode was recorded on the 28th of September last year, which is well before the midterm elections in the US that Greg refers to towards the end of the episode. You won't be surprised that his predictions proved rather accurate. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. My guest today is Professor Greg Barton, who is a research professor in global Islamic politics at Deakin University. Greg is also one of Australia's leading scholars of both modern Indonesia and of terrorism and countering violent extremism. For more than 25 years, Greg has undertaken extensive research on Indonesian politics and society, especially on the role of Islam as both a constructive and a disruptive force. He has been active in interfaith dialogue initiatives and has a deep commitment to building understanding of Islam and Muslim societies. Greg also has an interest in security studies, and particularly in countering violent extremism. He continues to research the offshoots of Jamaa Islamiyah and related radical Islamist movements in Southeast Asia. Greg is frequently interviewed by the Australian and international electronic and print media on radicalization, violent extremism, and terrorism, as well as on Indonesia and the politics of the Muslim world. He joins me today to discuss some of these topics, as well as their causes and potential solutions. Greg, thank you very much for joining me on The Voices of War. Well, great to be with you, man. Thanks for the invitation. So, Greg, before we dive into radicalization and violent extremism, uh, maybe we can start with finding out what motivated your entry into this rather murky world. How did you end up uh, studying this and researching it? That's a, a very good question. Um, I, my PhD thesis at Monash University in the in the late 80s, um, early 90s, was looking at progressive Islamic thought in Indonesia, the the renewal of Islamic thought movement. And I looked at figures like Nikhol Smajid, uh, Abdurrahman Wahid, Joanna Fendi. Mm. And their thought, although it was primarily concerned with how do you, how do religious values translate and apply in, in, a, in a modern world and modern society, their Ideas very much uh, captured the idea that uh, Islam should represent a push for recognition of human rights and uh, uh, accountable systems of government. And so by implication, they were pushing for 
uh, a shift in Indonesia away from Suharto's military-backed authoritarian rule to um, to democracy. Um, mm. And in fact, mm. in, in, in May 97, Suharto suddenly stepped down in the middle of a financial crisis when he couldn't form a new government, couldn't find cabinet members. And elections were held the following year, and there was a whole plethora of, of parties contesting, including many parties with a Muslim base. Mm-hmm. And in the parliamentary process of selecting a new president, first time was ever done inside the super parliament, uh, Abdullah bin Wahid was chosen as president. So I then went on to write a biography of Abdullah bin Wahid or Augusto. Mm-hmm. But in 2001, of course, when the 9-11 attacks occurred, mm-hmm. I, I recognized that Having spent the previous 10, 15 years looking at progressive Islamic thought in Indonesia, I'd better pay attention to the other end of the spectrum. Mm. So I looked around to see what was analogous in Indonesia to Al-Qaeda, or at least what influence Al-Qaeda might have sympathizing mm. groups. I looked at Jemaah Islamia. And then we had the Bali bombings of October of 12th. Of course, we were at that uh, 20th anniversary mm. of that really pivotal moment for Indonesia and for Australia. 202 mm. killed, um, 88 Australians. And I um, I read a, a, a book on Jemaah Islamia and... Basically, I haven't been able to walk away from this topic ever since because of the last 20 years. Well, yeah, uh, it's not yeah. my only interest and it's not my first interest, um, but it is an enduring interest. There is a squaring of the circle, though. Um, I was drawn to uh, Indonesia and progressive mm. Islamic thought because of the um, quality of the people I met and, and their sincerity. And I do quite a lot of work in, in the countering violent extremism space in Southeast Asia and, you know, this is working with civil society organizations that have those same values. They're, they're inspired by Islam, but in a, in a progressive way. Um, mm. So that's the redeeming side of looking at what can be a pretty grim topic. Yeah, well, I guess it's, uh, it's, it's two sides of the same coin, right? And, and I guess that's what we are going to dive into, perhaps. Uh, but maybe before we get into that, I think it might be useful to, I guess, distinguish between some of the terminology that's commonly used uh, when we're talking about terrorism, radicalization, or violent extremism. I don't know if those terms are sufficiently different to warrant a discussion, but I feel like in my mind, I'm not entirely clear between the differences. Uh, So I have to make the assumption that some of my audience members will be the same. So uh, maybe you can explain to us what is the difference between firstly radicalization and then extremism, and of course, finally terrorism. Well, uh, you're right, these terms overlap, but it is important to be clear about where the boundaries are and and what we mean by them. And they're Mm. used in very specific ways. Now, people will often say, well, there's no standard definition of terrorism. And that's Mm. true. I mean, different agencies around the world define things in, you know, for example, what's a threat to American society or Australian society. But leaving aside those those uh, in the specific elements and sort of an ad hoc after the case defining Mm-hmm. I think there's fairly broad consensus on what we mean by terrorism and violent extremism. But to back up, extremism in itself uh, and, and radicalization really um, refers to the process generally understood as a cognitive process by which somebody becomes to embrace extreme ideas. But I think it's increasingly understood that radicalization is is not just a cognitive process of embracing extreme ideas. It involves forming new friendships and new relationships of trust. And uh, often for individuals, it's it's joining a new family, having a new peer group, um, finding support, finding recognition. Now, that occurs in conventional religious or even non-religious settings. You could be joining, a, for example, an environmental activist movement. Mm. And that sense of belonging to a group, that the social network side of things, is, is often the most important and generally tends to proceed. So if we're talking about um, violent extremism, which is largely but not completely synonymous with terrorism, People generally get drawn to the community and the, and the relationships, often because somebody has gone after them in a predatory fashion to recruit them. But sometimes, mm. it happenstance can be, you know, extended family, siblings, etc. Uh, and then once they identify with the group, then they internalise the ideas. Um, so the ideas come after the, the social connection. Mm. Uh, the difference between just being radical or having extreme ideas and violent extremism or, I mean, radicalism is often substituted for uh, radicalism to violent extremism, but but we, we, the shorthand needs to be treated with care because to become radical is not a bad thing. You know, most good things in the world that have come mm. through social movements and change have involved a degree of, a degree of extremist conviction mm. and, and a degree of being radical. I mean, the, the definition of the word radical, of course, Going back to basics is it, it comes from uh, the Latin radix for, for root. And so it's mm. going back to the roots of things. And it's, uh, as we say in English, a, a root to branch transformation for many people. So somebody might become 
vegan, having first become vegetarian because they've concerned about animals and, mm. and they're concerned about the planet. They've done research. They've figured out, gee, there's a very compelling argument for me changing the way I live. And that, you know, in shorthand is a radical shift. Mm. But that's not a threat to anyone in itself. In fact, mm. it's it's a net good. Um, if more people made those sort of personal um, changes, that, then, you know, the planet would be better and our society would be better. So it's important to to recognize what can be positive about somebody being radical and, and what uh, even ideas that are called extreme might, might have a very positive social benefit, pro-social, if you like. The concern with um, radicalization into violent extremism is the violent part. And mm. uh, if somebody comes to a point where they justify violence, whether they actually use it or whether they threaten it, uh, it can still be powerful just by, by threat, then you end up with a, a, a dynamic where they feel that the ends are so important that they justify the means. Mm. And often, whether it's ideas from the, the, the far left, the far right, from uh, jihadi Islamist circles, which have borrowed from these, there's a framing of a grand conspiracy in which you are the victim. We have to change the system by fighting back. We need a revolution. And once we have the revolution, once we succeed, a small group of us at first, but eventually everyone, then we can put in place a new system. And with that new system, we can have the world that we need. So that, mm. by definition, is a political framing. And terrorism is defined as the use of violence or the threat of the use of violence to bring about a political change. Mm. And uh, that's a fairly universally agreed upon definition. Uh, there's general consensus. This applies to non-state actors. We know that states do terrible things. We're seeing Russia involved in war crimes in Ukraine mm. at the moment. Mm. And a, a lot of those war crimes are designed to intimidate and to destroy morale. You know, you fire artillery rounds into a, a school or a hospital, and, and if it's done in a cold-blooded, deliberate way rather than an accidental way, it's, it's to terrorize people. Mm. But that's generally treated separately from terrorism because it's not that states don't behave badly. They do. In fact, most mm. of the you know, um, the Assad regime has killed more people in uh, in Syria than has Al Qaeda or Islamic State. Mm, mm, so it's mm. not a, a qualitative or even a quantitative distinction. It's just that it's such a big field that what states do is best discussed separately. Although mm. it does overlap because of proxy conflicts and and and, uh, and the actions, I guess, end up being terrorism. It's just not necessarily by a terrorist. Uh, yes, organization because we can't have a state, and, and I guess this is perhaps why the language around, say, you know, that, that's that's contemporary right now about why uh, the world and U.S. in particular is recognizing Russia as a state supporting terrorism rather than as, than as a terrorist state. Is that right? That's a big part of the logic. Um, it's not to say that won't change. One of the problems in, in most Western democracies, the legal definition is once you designate a group as a terrorist group, then by definition, you can't have any kind of dealings with them. You're, right. you're closed off that option. Okay. Uh, sometimes you have to do that. But we saw it done reluctantly with Hamas mm -hmm. and with Hezbollah, for example. So with Hezbollah for a long time, you'd speak to the political side, but not to the militant side. Recently, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps in Iran was designated a terrorist group. Mm. Um, so why not the government? Well, partly because you still want to be able to talk to the government to negotiate. So it's a bit like that with Russia. Okay. There's another problem that comes to play, though. In America, uh, just to sort of put things in context, the mm. biggest terrorist problem at the moment in terms of the number of groups and the number of attacks, by far the biggest problem is, is far-right extremism. Mm. Mm. So mm. why are more groups and individuals not charged with terrorism offences? And it's partly to do with the fact that terrorism is defined, not logically, just because of circumstances of history. Terrorism is defined in American uh, jurisdictions as involving international networks, ah, um, okay. non-state actors that are that are transnational um, from outside America. So if you've got a group like the, the Proud Boys, for example, mm. which is certainly engaged by most definitions in terrorism, they don't neatly fall under existing legislation. So that's a, that's a quirk of American legislation. It's not the same in other countries necessarily. Mm. It's one reason why definitions are so important. Mm. You know, generally speaking, we're talking non-state actors uh, using violence or threatening violence with with the intention of bringing about political change. So there are some actors like the incels, the involuntary celebrate, mm -hmm. who some would say are not really terrorists because they're not trying to bring about political change. Others say, no, the framing of the narrative, the sense of collective identity, the sense of a movement, the sense of, of trying to bring about change that qualifies as, as, as acting for political change, so that is terrorism. I, I would probably think that's a, a fairer way of seeing things. Mm, mm, um, mm. And then there's that distinction between terrorism and violent extremism, which isn't so clear-cut, but generally, um, whilst there's an overlap, there are some kinds of extremist 
behaviour and extremism generally involves a sense of belonging to a larger group uh, mm -hmm. when they become violent, whether or not it fits the definition of terrorism according to, to legal jurisdiction, we can sort of define violent extremism slightly more broadly than terrorism, but essentially essentially synonymous in most cases. Mm, mm, mm. That's wonderful. There are so many potential threads there uh, that you've laid out for us. Uh, the first thing I just want to pick up on is this the notion that radicalism is not necessarily negative. Uh, I really like that because as you, you know, the example you used about, you know, protecting the planet, uh, we also know that it's the more extreme uh, versions of ourself or, or in our society are the ones that are going to move the needle forward. Uh, we know that bulk of the society wants the status quo uh, and there are those kind of change makers that will force change. I guess the difficulty then is determining what is good versus bad you know, either for one social group or for the world at large, because that's the contestation of narratives. Uh, and I guess this is really where one can really find an appreciation for the age-old saying, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, right? Is that, that's, is that a, a, a neat summary of the, of the problem, I guess? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a neat summary, but it's a partial summary, because mm -hmm. in a sense, it's when people fall back on saying, well, one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist, it, it's a little bit of a straw man, because mm -hmm. it's it's um, it's not really defining the actual problem. Uh, mm. I think the definition of saying that the use of violence or the threat of violence for a political purpose, uh, and, and the definition, as I said, it almost universally applies to non-state actors. And uh, historically, people have thought of it as, as uh, involving targets that uh, are not combatants. Now, that's, mm -hmm. that blurs with an insurgency that's particularly tricky, but I mean, you know, in rough terms, somebody, when the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam went from fighting in the jungles against the Sri Lankan military to going into the cities with suicide bombers, then that went from the, the methods of insurgency to the methods of terrorism. And terrorism is a method. Mm, mm -hmm. We tend to think of it as, we conflate it as being an idea or a way of life, but actually in the first instance, it's a method. So when the ANC started to use violence, they were crossing a threshold from being a civil rights protest movement wanting to bring about political change, of course, ending apartheid, which you know I think most people mm -hmm. would agree was good, mm -hmm. and using the methods of terrorism. They did so with some caution. They didn't want to kill people. They targeted infrastructure. But still, that's a, a, a line where you're crossing over. I think it's important to recognize that line. That is, I think, the line at which the state can legitimately step in. But there's another problem that goes with that. Um, uh, when David Cameron was prime minister, he said, uh, I think, quite rightly, that um, we need to deal with violent extremism before it becomes violent. That is logical. Mm -hmm. You've got to work upstream. But he couldn't define where you would intervene before it became mm -hmm. violent, and that's undermined the credibility of, of countering violent extremism um, in, in some U uh, UK operations. I think personally... Why is that? Is that because it's, uh, we're, we're in kind of going down the thought police? Uh, exactly, uh, yeah. We, yeah. We don't okay. want to be... We don't want to... You can believe completely that the moon is made of green cheese... Mm. Um, you can believe the earth is flat. Uh, you can believe that um, uh, COVID-19 vaccines you know, change your DNA. You are entitled, however wrong, to believe those things. Mm. And as we know, when somebody gets into a conspiracy theory frame of mode, it becomes a social thing. They, they, they are in the information bubble, particularly with social media. So it's pretty hard to nudge them directly. You've got to be sort of patiently stepped through the relationship and hope you can come out the other side with these people. We've seen this this last few years with COVID mm. and then bizarre conspiracies that in the cold light of day just don't make any sense, but sensible, intelligent people believe them. So think of QAnon, for example, as well yeah. as the various COVID-19 conspiracies. As concerning as those things are and, and as disruptive as they can be, and they cause real problems. So if somebody is pushing anti-vax position, then that's a problem in, for public health and, and for workplaces and, you know, it's for families, it's difficult but we don't want to be in the business of thought police and, and, and counter-terrorism and counter-violent extremism should never be about policing what ideas somebody has. It should be about behavior. So mm -hmm. we need to mm -hmm. bring it back to the level of behavior. So when David Cameron said in 2015, we need to deal with violent extremism before it becomes uh, violent, okay, mm -hmm. fine. I, I think picking up on, on the answer that he didn't give, a legitimate place to intervene before you get violence is when you get hate, uh, contempt and hate and hate speech and incitement of hatred. If that's sufficiently clear and of a sufficient level, whether it's an elected official or a media commentator, that then I think I mean, we need to define our laws and we don't have laws in place perfectly. But that is a legitimate space for the, the, um, the state to intervene. So the state in any of our governments, I mm -hmm. think, quite legitimately 
I think we could frame saying, yeah, you have, you have the right, for example, to believe in a caliphate, but if you incite hatred against all who fellow Muslims or non-Muslims who reject your idea, then that's a problem. Hmm. So when Indonesia banned the group Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia that uh, was pushing aggressively this idea of a caliphate, including during the rise of ISIS, so it became a, a problem in terms of this hmm. to amplify that message, uh, they were criticized. It was disbanded by a presidential decree, I think. And, and then more recently, the um, notorious uh, group uh, Front Pambela Islam, the Islamic Defenders Front, was similarly um, shut down by a presidential decree. I think a smarter way of proceeding in that context is to say, OK, you are being addressed by legal means um, when you, you break state laws and your behavior is bad. And the behavior mm. in question here is hate speech and incitement of hatred, which certainly Front Pambela Islam was doing. Mm. I, I just think that's a better way of framing it. Our concern should be about bad behavior, not about bad ideas. Not that bad ideas are not consequential. They are. Mm, of um, course, yeah. Well, we try that's and, the upstream cause, right? Yeah. It, it's Well, it's part of the upstream cause. Part, as I said, yeah, exactly, yeah, it's, part, yeah. it's the social networks. So even before mm. people take those ideas on, it's the social networks. But, you know, we've, we've got to address those things together. Mm. But I think we've got a better foundation for being effective if we uh, address the bad behavior and then address the social context of, of, of the social relationships. But also to go back to our earlier discussion, I think we need to legitimate, we need to recognize the legitimate grievances and mm. the human needs. So the need to belong, to be accepted, uh, to be part of a group, to have a sense of purpose in life. That Those are positive things. So you want to mm. counter mm. that at the ideas level. We need to counter it with similar positive ideas and say, look, here's a way to, for example, fight for climate action that has a chance of, of bringing about real positive change. And uh, I think it's important, for example, if I'm, I'm just using a, a, one example with could apply in many scenarios. If you're dealing with a group that perhaps might use violence, and most, to be fair, most environmental activists at this point are not using violence, but if you had a group that was tipping over that threshold into becoming a group that used terrorist methods, I think it's important to establish trust and relations with the, the leaders of the movement and to say, look, your prime target is to bring about political change for, for good reason, but you're not going to get the public on side. And we've seen this with recent mass protests all around the world. The public gets very upset with groups that turn to uh, what appears to be indiscriminate violence, and, and it undermines legitimate causes. Of course, for an environmental group, the danger is if they are using really edgy approaches, some mm -hmm. other group may come in and hijack. We've seen literally neo-Nazi groups hijack uh, anti-COVID protests, anti-COVID vaccine, uh, mandatory vaccination mm -hmm. protests. Mm -hmm. So I think trying to work and establish trust and contact with, with movement leaders where there is a movement and there's a leadership, recognizing legitimate grievances, legitimate causes, making the argument strongly that, you know, it's, your beliefs are fine. In fact, you know, we may even agree that they're very good beliefs, mm -hmm. but methods of violence are not going to work. Methods of hate, incitement of hatred are not going to work. Yeah. Again, there's some, potentially so many threads, and I, and I definitely want to pick up on some of them as we as we get deeper into this. But I just want to backtrack a little bit because you keep hitting on something really important, uh, and that is these motivations. Uh, you know, what inspires uh, hateful and violent extremism? Uh, and, and you've mentioned a number of, I guess, conditions that are necessary for people to embrace uh, such uh, ideologies. But I know in, in a lot of your work, you've written about push, pull, and personal uh, factors. Uh, and I think that's a neat way for us to visualize what happens to people who are radicalized? So could you please cover those in relation to how people actually become radicalized uh, through those uh, three factors? Sure. Okay. Well, the first thing, Maz, of course, is to recognize that just as terms are never completely adequate yeah. uh, and they all carry baggage. So any models that um, an academic... It's just the model, right? Yeah. Of models, yeah. The <laughs> models have the limitations. So it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's the beginning point of, of framing and thinking about things. But the three Ps, push-pull, personal factors, is not a bad way of, of framing things uh, in, in as much as we can see circumstantial factors, you know, poverty. Um, you might have, for example, at the moment in, in um, the Horn of Africa, including South mm. Somalia, where Al-Shabaab is strong, uh, you've got a four-year-long drought. That's an accelerant. Um, if people are forced out of, of farmland into the cities and then they're going to look for cash to buy food and water, that doesn't cause terrorism, but it's it's a, um, a factor that brings in vulnerabilities. Mm, mm. If you have an insurgency, as you have with Al-Shabaab in Somalia and, and the east of Kenya, or as you have had with Bangsamoro uh, groups in um, the west of Mindanao and the south of the Philippines, uh, if you have an insurgency, then there are the factors of, of, of economic um, need, uh, of local injustice. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the Philippines, you know, a, a strong factor which 
seems counterintuitive at first is is Rido or clan clan feuds. Uh, mm. People might, for example, join a Busayev group because they want protection from a clan feud that otherwise threatens them because they don't have strong partners. So um, those things sort of play into being push factors. Mm, mm, mm. Pull factors uh, you can understand as, as the thing that attracts, that draws, that pulls you in. So if somebody says, look, Maz, the reason you're suffering is it's not your fault. Uh, you're a mm. victim. The system is screwing you. The system is wrong. The system needs to be changed. And, you know, we've got a plan to change the system. We're going to have a revolution. It'll take time, but we'll succeed. And uh, then, you know, we'll be on the right side of history and we'll put a, a good system in place. Uh, the caliphate will make everything fantastic or mm. the um, the revolution will bring in injustice. We'll have, um, you know, an, an ideal Maoist, Marxist state, whatever your, you know, flavor might the be. The Taliban will be back. Yeah, yeah the Taliban will be back. And <laughs> yeah. when the Taliban are back, it's Afghans in charge of Afghanistan yeah. and everything's going to be fine. Well, yeah. you know, no, it's not. not mm. The revolutions never, never deliver, of course. Revolutionary mm. change. You know, we speak of revolutionary change in loose terms and it's, True, we need, for example, to have a revolution in uh, electrifying everything, electric mm-hmm. vehicles, everything mm-hmm. else electric, mm-hmm. move away from um, carbon polluting energy. Um, but uh, the actual literal term revolution is not what, not what we want, because when we look at every historical example of a revolution, I don't mean a metaphorical uh, industrial revolution type mm-hmm. thing, I mean mm-hmm. an actual political revolution, it, it, it produces bad stuff because because of the way people are. And then in the personal factors, um, and these things blur a little bit, but um, if if you have talked about the importance of belonging to a group, feeling accepted, having a sense of esteem, having a sense of purpose, having people you can feel are your people, that's that's really important. Now, mm-hmm. if if you've had a tragedy in the family, you've lost a, a parental figure, uh, or um, you know, you're going through a bad patch in school, and we're talking often of teenagers and, and, and people in their 20s. Uh, you've gone through a relationship bust up. That doesn't by itself predispose you to joining a criminal gang or a terrorist group. But if somebody from one of those groups comes along and tries to recruit you through this approach of saying, you know, be with us, we will look after you, then that personal vulnerability opens up the possibility that you will join. So there's sort of larger factors of injustice and grievance and just compelling circumstances. You're in a drought. You have to leave the farm. Uh, there's the attraction of a powerful narrative that pulls you in, and then there's the personal factors. You know, perhaps your your dad died last year, and there's, you're the sole breadwinner in your family. And somebody says, "Join Shabob, and 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 we'll pay you this much per week, and and look after your family. And if you if you do get killed, you'll be a martyr, and the family will get this much money." Mm, mm, Those mm, things come mm. together, and that's you know, it's a crude kind of model, uh, I, I grant, but it's not yeah. a bad way of framing quite distinctive but overlapping uh, elements. I think it's uh, – I couldn't agree more. I think what it does for me, at least, I'm a visual learner, so it creates literally images as you're talking about characters uh, who may be attracted uh, towards uh, a particular ideology or be radicalized uh, for a cause for reasons beyond their control, so circumstantial. Now, we know the situationism doesn't explain everything, and it's certainly not deterministic in, the, in a sense that if I'm in this situation – Therefore, I will 100% join uh, a radical group. No, it's about, and as you 100%, uh, I think, rightly pointed out, uh, it's probabilities. It increases your probability because it opens up a number of vulnerabilities inside your, I guess, mind or your circumstances that will allow some of these push, pull or personal factors to act upon you and guide you down a path. I think it's a critically important point because it, it, it allows us to create empathy for those in those circumstances uh, to actually understand the lived experience of people in those situations. Uh, I've talked about it on the podcast a number of times about you know Taliban, those who we very crudely termed Taliban, oftentimes were dirt farmers uh, who were experiencing one of these push-pull or personal factors. Uh, you know, whether it could be just to put food on the table, uh, they would carry IED parts for actual Talibs uh, yeah. just to get a bit of money. Uh, and I think this is a point that is hugely important but is often missed because even in our evolved public discourse, uh, let's try and call it that, which I don't think it is, uh, we tend to go for simple black and white uh, narratives. How much do you think that's a problem uh, and, or, or how broadly do you think people actually uh, understand the push-pull uh, and personal factors? Uh, and is this something that, in your view, is discussed sufficiently, uh, sufficiently deeply? 
I think people often, particularly practitioners, often have an intuitive grasp of this. Um, but setting it out as a model and saying, let's, let's sort of break it down and reflect on the different elements. What's happening in your case is important. Um, you know, I spoke earlier about the difference between, um, violent extremism and, and, and the role of hate. Mm. Um, I think to, to extend the model, you can think of, Violent extremism and hateful extremism, where hateful extremism may not necessarily be violent at all, mm, but it's, mm. it's a net negative for society and for the individuals experiencing racism or, or um, anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, whatever it might be. Uh, I think to uh, you know stay with the three-cornered model, um, we can. And I mentioned in groups like uh, Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam and Al Shabab and, and Abu Sayyaf group. Uh, where you've got an insurgency, you've got a different kind of violence. So conflict violence often involves violent extremist and, 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 and terrorist narratives and ele- elements, but it's, it, it is its own thing. It overlaps. Mm-hmm. So think of that triangle and think of uh, perhaps a, a Venn diagram with quite a bit of overlap mm. between hateful extremism, violent extremism and, uh, and conflict violence. Then we begin to get a, a, a better picture and the push-pull personal factors that take somebody into violent extremism or into hateful extremism or into conflict violence or insurgent violence, that, that, that those mixes differ. So mm. poverty and, and structural factors of, of just daily survival often play a bigger role in insurgent violence than they do in, in you know, joining you know, a, a middle class kid and a comfortable home in a, for example, an Australian suburb mm-hmm. joining Islamic State is generally not doing so because they're pushed because of, of terrible circumstances. Mm-hmm. But as you said, poor uh, farmer in Afghanistan uh, often ends up basically joining the Taliban um, or at least helping them mm. over the last 20 years has been the story just because of grueling circumstances. Um, mm, mm. And so that, that's a very and different... Hedging their bets, ultimately, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think we need to recognise that if we've got an insurgency, which was the case with the Taliban and took, they took charge, uh, now they're fighting their own insurgent problems with mm. uh, IS Khorasan mm. uh, and other groups. An insurgency has different dynamics, and so the push-pull personal factors weight differently and, and interact differently. I, I think we need to pay more attention to systemic organised hate uh, because it's a growing problem. It's particularly associated with the far right and, and white supremacy, but but not just with that. I mean, it, mm. it manifests in Asia and Africa as well mm. uh, with this idea that my group is, you know, experiencing a great replacement threat of being you know, our mm. rights being taken away. Hate is really an important thing to understand there. And what draws somebody to be involved in, in that sort of group, you know, that, that same individual may not be at all open to going and joining a really violent group. Um, and, and so the... the, the, the um, motivating factors are going to have a different mix but these things overlap and it's important to think of them in these broad terms and to you know go back to your question i think we need to do we need to do this conceptual work uh more fully and um thoughtfully because if we just fall back on simple definitions and and it's often tough for practitioners if you're a police officer in the middle of a pretty demanding uh position uh you're an army um uh, officer sent into an insurgent situation You've got tunnel vision and you've got cognitive overload, you're tired, you're angry, you've experienced loss, and you can fall back on rather simple models, and that's not helpful. And we saw that with disastrous consequences. Australia relied extraordinarily heavily on special forces being rotated on high rotation into Uruzgan in Afghanistan, and um, by all accounts, it appears that some people did some very bad things, mm. and uh, they need to be held to account, but we also need to look at the structural factors that, that made that likely. And I think, um, you know, we placed individuals in a stressed fatigue situation where they are not well positioned to stop and think about how do I build rapport and relationships and understand motivation with these these, these um, mm. people in the Afghan community. They just began to see, as as do the terrorists and us and their mentality, and the, then, then they become part of the problem. That's, uh, I mean, that's so spot on from my view. And, and this is a topic that I addressed quite frequently uh, on the pod, uh, particularly this kind of uh, the upstream causes that will lead otherwise good people to do things that they themselves could never have imagined uh, or thought about, you know, merely months uh, before. So what is what are those conditions uh, that will lead people down that path? Uh, and and I, I couldn't agree more. It ultimately, I mean, am I, am I right to say that even some of our soldiers might have become radicalized? Uh, or, you know, do, do, do those terms, do those definitions also apply to them, right? Yeah, I think as, as long as we're careful not to be simplistic about it, I think yeah, that's a good way of putting it. So, you know, um, 
Uh, and I also want to highlight allegedly also. Sure, I think it's important sure. to stress that. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you, you mentioned the Taliban. Well, the Taliban haven't been very good at communications, but a group that's been really good in communications is, is ISIS, Islamic mm. State, um, through products mm. like the big magazine, um, available in many languages, including English in sort of glossy PDF, uh, you know, well, well curated, well produced uh, magazines, much better, for example, than Al Qaeda's Inspire magazine in the past, much higher quality. Mm. But I mentioned that because when you look at a lot of the articles in Dabiq, it's been a few years now, so it's, it's, it's sort of from an earlier period, but it gives you a sense of the appeal. It's a little bit like military recruiting uh, material, where it says, come and join us, join a group of people, you'll be one of the guys, one of the girls, um, you'll have a sense of purpose, you'll learn some skills, you'll be making a difference, pretty attractive. Mm. Yeah, fun toys and, and good conditions mm. as well, that helps. So in a sense, we're not a million miles away. Um, the guys fighting... ISIS or the Taliban uh, um, in, in uniform, you know, are driven by many of the same sorts of human needs. They're part of a group. They have a sense of uh, esprit de corps. They have a purpose. They've been trained up. They're doing something. They think they like. I think they're making some good, um, bringing about change. You know, I feel sorry for military veterans who now look back and say, "Why did we ever go there? Because we didn't do the good we wanted to do. We didn't stay the course." That's another story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's important to understand that. So. To the extent the stuff goes bad, the terrorist group, of course, has bad intentions all along because their means, their methods, are to use violence in a you know mm. in a way that is really destructive and indiscriminate. Uh, military uses violence, but in a way that it hopes is just and accountable. But it's easier to cross that line from the just and accountable use of application of violence to the the uh, unjust and and non accountable use of violence, particularly if you're, you know, the one point of reference is your NCO. And you're out in the middle of, of, you know, a long way from anywhere else, and you're, all the accountability you have is the after-action reports. It's no wonder that sometimes bad things will happen. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I've interviewed a number of uh, military ethicists on that very point. It, it 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 strikes me as a point that's often missed. Uh, and again, because we'd like to then throw them out as a few bad apples, uh, which again, you know, gives elevates us on 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 a on a moral high ground, as though these are merely uh, somehow broken soldiers. Uh, rather than realizing that no one is born a war criminal, uh, there's a path to that. Uh, and undoubtedly, the conditions that they've served under contribute to that. And also the narratives and, and the information uh, that they are, I guess, uh, uh, consuming, understanding, contextualizing. Uh, and again, this brings us to a really, really important point, and you keep bringing it up, and, and, and I just feel like it needs to be stressed. It really comes down to all of this uh, as though it ultimately boils down to an absence of genuine human connection. Uh, on one hand, we have the perceived or, or perhaps even real rejection by the state or one social group, which is that kind of you know, push factor. On the other hand, we have uh, those preying on the vulnerable, promising a sense of belonging, a sense of uh, vision, purpose, which is the kind of pull factors. Uh, and of course, we have the, the individual personalities or our own individual histories that we all bring to the party, which is why not everybody will become radicalized, but there needs to be certain, as you said before, vulnerabilities. What is the role of social media in this? You've mentioned, uh, you've, you've mentioned it uh, in passing before, but given that we are now more connected than ever, but also far lonelier than ever, uh, in other words, we have higher quantity of connections, but they're generally speaking far lower in quality. What do you think is the role of social media in the radicalization that we're seeing, particularly the far right radicalization that you've mentioned a number of times as well uh, in the West? Well, I think, I think you're right about those points, uh, Maz, but we need to, of course, be careful to think that um, technology somehow changes everything. It, it seldom is the case that technology changes course, everything. Yeah, it it yeah. tends to accelerate. Um, yeah, an enabler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an enabler. Um, but we have, I think, been caught by a few changes in recent years. The COVID-19 lockdowns have, have, have seen um, people stressed and, and spending more time online. At the same time, social media is becoming more important anyway. I mean, social media doesn't exist a whole lot, you know, beyond 10, 15 years ago. It's mm. uh, digital age is, uh, is fairly recent. Um, it's hard to imagine a world without Facebook, um, but you know, uh, it wasn't that long ago we didn't have. Well, yeah. So the difference okay. it makes is that it, 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 it makes it easier for us to connect with uh, like-minded people. So if you like connect, uh, collecting um, 
you know, mid 20th century model fire trucks, uh, <laughs> there will be a community mm-hmm. online for you mm-hmm. and you can join a Facebook group or other social media platform and, you know, you can exchange and you can, and that's great. You know, that's a really yeah, positive, positive thing. I mean, yeah. it's a random example, but I mean, I'm sure you could do that for yeah, anything. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and if you find your old school, you know, classmates in Facebook or something similar, that, that can be good too. And you can connect with people. So, um, it, it enables you to find a like-minded community or, for, you know, be drawn into something that can be very powerful. Um, but of course, it, it opens the way for predatory behavior. And we do know the social media platforms, the whole kind of entrepreneurial shtick behind uh, this domain. Mark Zuckerberg, by all accounts, genuinely believed that Facebook would make the world better and that all we needed to do was connect people and good things would happen. And he wasn't completely wrong, but he ignored the fact that a lot of bad things were happening. And of course, the algorithms that drive social media, because social media... It's not a charity. It's 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 a business. And mostly, we don't pay up front for our social media. Uh, mostly, they, the companies that put a lot of personnel and a lot of resources into running their operations, uh, rely on advertising. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. if we're not paying them, um, but they're they're you know sending us ads through corner of our screen or, or however else it's 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 framed, then uh, how do they get their revenue? They've got to show to the, the the guys paying for the advertising time. It's not like television where you say you. You know, we gave you 20 minutes last night. It's mm-hmm. it's like we've had this many clicks. Yeah. So, of course, the more clicks they get, the more advertising revenue they get. So their algorithms are set up to give you material that you want to click on. Yeah, to keep you Unders- on screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, understandable. Mm-hmm. But it, uh, it, it means that if you're looking for mid-century model tire trucks, fine, you're probably safe. Mm-hmm. But once mm-hmm. you start looking for something slightly edgy, you get more and more edgy stuff. And it, it can take you down a, a dark place, a rabbit hole, very quickly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At the same time, social media is 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 not just you know one way passive consumption. It's a it's a chance to form relationships and, and get into a conversation. So somebody seeing that you're hanging around watching I don't know some pretty gruesome you know videos from from Syria, then says strikes up a friendship and says hey you know um, I saw you here yesterday um, you know, where are you from what are you doing and, and you, once the the rapport is established they might say. What about we don't just keep on talking here? Let's go mm-hmm. to Telegram or some other mm-hmm. space, mm-hmm. space and we'll have a chat there. And then they, they, you know, it's grooming very often. It's in the case of recruitment, it is predatory behavior. Social media has made that possible. So, uh, you know, literally there's been cases of a kid in Melbourne builds pipe bombs because a 14 year old in, in central England is giving them instructions. Now, mm. Um, the old uh, New Yorker cartoon uh, with the Labrador at the keyboard saying, on the internet, no one knows that you're a dog, <laughs> mm, 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 has an mm. element of truth in it, in, in that uh, people are more easily fooled. Um, I've talked about teenagers and 20-somethings being vulnerable to recruitment, but um, sometimes when I'm giving a lecture uh, to an, an older cohort, if, if you know it's you know middle-aged people, I'd say, how many people do you know who have um, made some mistakes when it comes to to online um, dating apps? You know, has, mm-hmm. has, has anything ever gone wrong for anyone you know? Mm-hmm. And of course, hands go up because and, and a light goes on in people's head. They say, "Yeah, okay, I thought it was just dumb teenagers." But when you want to believe that the person on the other end of the line is the person they say they are, and you want to believe that they genuinely like you and you genuinely have something, mm-hmm. that's the beginning of a lot of vulnerability mm-hmm. and social media. Well, it, it could be a guy you met at the bar, right? Yeah. Or a girl that you met um, at a party face to face. That happens. It's happened mm. throughout human history. But online, well, it's called just, human intelligence, right? <laughs> yeah. Online, there's so many more opportunities mm. um, that uh, things can go bad much more quickly. And, and predators have, um, you know, part of the attraction for predators is that their overheads are low in that virtual space. So they just move on. You know, most times they try and, and, and engage somebody and, and, and um, groom them. It's probably going to fail. It doesn't matter because they're not expending much money or time doing that. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that sort of low level of friction, the fact that they can quickly move on and do it on scale, mm. means they're more likely to have an impact, uh, whether it's, you know, predatory sexual behavior, predatory financial behavior, or, uh, you know, trying to get somebody to buy into your scam, that sort of social engineering where people devolve information that ends up, um, you know, uh, being used against them. Mm. Or, uh, you know, very often it is literally a relationship where you sort of feel this is my friend and, okay, they're asking for help. I'm going to help them. I trust them because I, I, I know, I, you know, you don't know. You know, many times police will tell you that when they um, have to go to a victim and say the person you thought was, was your friend isn't your friend, this is who they really are, they say, no, no, I, I know them. I I, I you, you went there. I, I, I formed this relationship. 
the um, you know the tagline from the X Files, um, I want to believe, is a very mm. human response. Mm. And when it comes to relationships, it's a very powerful response. So social media has that amplifying, speeding up, low friction aspect to it. Of course, it's global, so it doesn't have to be somebody in your suburb, your town. It can be somebody from the other side of the world. And, you know, we saw with Islamic State, people travel from all over the world mm. where they had no immediate connection because of relationships that formed online. So yeah, it, yeah. it is a game changer, not, but not because it changes everything by dint of technology, just because of the way it speeds things up. and makes Yeah, things it's, I guess it's not the cause, right? Human nature is in no. many ways the cause, but it certainly facilitates it. And, and also what it does is draws you away from your other social networks. Uh, particularly if you've already have some vulnerabilities or you have uh, your, you know, quote unquote, a loner or, and, and, I've, and I've seen a bunch of uh, terms used in your research as well uh, that probably fit, I guess, the kind of, you know, somebody who's depressed, has low self-esteem, has alienated, isolated, uh, doesn't have too many friends, um, you know, or, or even I think the term used in there is a misfit. Those are already vulnerabilities that could be exploited by somebody online. And, and that's something that's rather new because it's taken it to scale. So it's nothing really new it's just that it's taken it to scale and it's, it's also it's also about the information feed so it, it's where do you get your news in the in the past you may have watched the evening television news read the newspaper now if your news comes from facebook or another platform and it's curated through an algorithm that just not only speeds things up but it changes the trajectory of things very often because you start to get a very limited view of the world you're not exposed to to different ideas you're ex often exposed to increasingly extreme ideas mm. so you know, that happened before social media existed, but it's happening much more easily and more powerfully with social media. And I guess one of the things that most people in the West don't really realize, there are parts of the world where Facebook is the internet. Um, I, mean, right. I remember I worked in Iraq uh, uh, as a civilian and, you know, we were looking after establishing social media platforms in Iraq and the absolute power of Facebook alone in Iraq to disseminate information. In fact, it's for everything, for all the the, the six primary emotions, yes. you go to Facebook. Uh, and also, I've, I've recently also read Facebook has literally laid physical cables around the entire continent of Africa uh, yep. in order to be able to provide internet for a continent. Uh, and you buy a phone, uh, Facebook comes free, but you have to pay for the internet. Uh, and of course, uh, at some ridiculous prices for some of these parts of the world. So therefore, this then, again, amplifies the problem because if the only way of communicating or getting information is through a ecosystem or through a business model that is designed to keep you on the platform as long as possible and keep you as, or, or to radicalize you, I guess, or to get you to uh, be as interested, uh, as engaged as possible, then there is a significant problem uh, lying in the way. And, we, and I guess we've, we've already seen it. It's nothing, uh, nothing really new. Um, one of the things that I want to perhaps pivot to is, uh, you know, over the last 20 years, and you've been quite a vocal proponent of, uh, of the global war on terror or, or its failings, perhaps, because one of the things we've tried to do, West broadly construed, uh, and of course, Australia is uh, there as well, is we've tried to, uh, if not stem the flow of terrorism, then at least minimize it, uh, uh, certainly to our own shores. But we haven't been very successful, have we? Why do you think that is the case? Yeah, the, the success question is important to think about. We have had success in terms of stopping uh, those Al-Qaeda-style attacks of the 2000s, you know, large ambitious attacks, sort of mm -hmm. um, obviously 9-11, but also London or Madrid. Those sort of things haven't been repeated because police counterterrorism intelligence has gotten very good. And, uh, and any group that spends any time chattering about where do we get explosives, how do we make IEDs, mm. you know, what's our target, they get picked up. And the plot gets disrupted, not not just in Western democracies. The Indonesians mm -hmm. have become very good at doing this through their specialist counterterrorism uh, policing after waking up to the challenge uh, 20 years ago with the Bali bombing. So we now have a situation where um, some people say, well, terrorism has gone away. Well, of course, the last few years, our news cycle has been taken up with COVID and strange political manifestations. So mm -hmm. it's kind of been bumped off. But it is true in, in, in many global cities, we haven't seen much by way of terrorism, either because um, groups are not as active or haven't got the motivation, but probably more likely because from what the authorities tell us that you know, they're trying, they're still trying, um, but the counterterrorism um, intelligence and, and um, detection and disruption piece is working really well. So what we have seen, though, is in areas where there's, there's um, 
a breakdown of good governance uh, where there's an insurgent that's very, or multiple insurgencies that are persistent, uh, we, we see not just a terrorist group come in and take root, but it, it becomes like a parasitic presence in the body politic. And to you know, extend the medical metaphor, if your immune system is suppressed through um, environmental circumstances, diet, fatigue, then things that otherwise wouldn't worry you start to take over. And uh, your immune system doesn't have the, the wherewithal to, to do the normal, normal level of protection that you know, we rely on. Um, mm. And that happens in, 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 um, in, in nation states in a body politic. So uh, it has been the pattern for the last 20 years that terrorism is worse where there's a breakdown of good governance. But part of the problem with our military response to a terrorist threat, which is you know an understandable response, 9-11, how do we respond? Well, okay, the, it was Al-Qaeda. They were based in, in the mountains of Afghanistan. Let's go there and let's get them. We don't think through, and military, you know, uh, military um, leaders like to talk about strategy. Um, they like to wheel out Klausowitz or, or Sensu mm-hmm. or other sort of thinkers and, and say, we've got to think about this. But operationally, of course, they don't have complete control. They're often simply told to do stuff by political leaders, which is the way things work in democracies. But even where they do have control, they often tend to fall back on siloed short-term thinking. Okay, this is my command. It's my tour of duty. This is what I'm going to achieve. These are the things. Uh, these are the uh, wait. You've served. I, I hadn't realised. How how, how no. you so tapped in? <laughs> you know, it's not. A, I haven't served, but it, it, it's not a, a well kept secret. You can sort of like, like, talking to people who have served, right? Oh, um, and, and and the analysis of what went wrong so in Iraq, and, yeah. And, yeah. And, and Afghanistan speaks to that. So mm. it meant that we militaries, Western militaries, had a series of tactical successes and strategic failure. So Afghanistan is one massive series of considerable tactical successes and overall strategic failure, mm. Iraq, too, you could say. Mm. Uh, Iraq, we shouldn't have been there in the first place, arguably. It was political manipulation of intelligence to justify a case. Uh, Afghanistan, I think probably we should have been there, but we should have been very clear about what we wanted to achieve and how we were going to achieve it and, and been open to a feedback loop. But the feedback loop was closed down in Afghanistan. So every time we got bad news, we said, don't tell me the bad news. This is what I want to know. This is what I've got to report up the chain. So uh, we actually created the problems in which terrorism becomes an existential threat. And terrorism is not an existential threat, generally speaking. It, it's an annoyance. It takes a lot of police resources. Uh, in most societies, you can't ignore it, otherwise it'll come back. But it doesn't. It doesn't threaten our existence. Mm, mm, mm. You know, on a on a, on a worst case scenario in Somalia or in northern Nigeria or in Iraq or or um, uh, Afghanistan, it is an existential threat, absolutely. And we c- have, in our military response, contributed to, to the circumstances that allow it to become this parasitic insurgent presence that is then so powerful that it's a, a threat to the, the very existence of societies and, and states. Okay, and that's, I think, important. So how, how have we done that, or how do we? How has that happened? Well, surprisingly easily. Uh, it involves not thinking through where we're going, not having a, a clear sense of the end state we want to get to. For all of the military talk about, you know, thinking about centres of gravity and, and goals and strategy, we, we just haven't put it into practice as we should have. So... You can make the case, as I said, with Iraq, we shouldn't have gone out in the first place mm-hmm. because there wasn't a good reason to do so. Not that Saddam Hussein was good, but if we topple him, what do we get? Something worse. No-fly zone over Libya. Oh, yeah, uh, Muammar Gaddafi is a, is a bad actor. Mm-hmm. What happens if you take away Muammar Gaddafi from, um, from, uh, from Libya? Turns out there's never been a stable government ever historically in the whole mm-hmm. of Libya, and we now are living with that, that nightmare situation. Afghanistan, I, you know, I think it's, I'm not saying we never use military means. I think I, there was a case in Afghanistan very mm-hmm. strongly, but because we didn't think through what we were doing, you know, and we never know the what ifs of history, the counterfactuals. Possibly there could have been a deal struck with the Taliban at the end of 2001. Um, maybe that's the case. Maybe it's not. But in any case, negotiating with the Taliban where possible for some sort of political settlement uh, all through those 20 years. Uh, but having the, the resources in place to make sure that our presence was helping the people mm. not actually contributing to their problems. I mean, you know, um, this is another whole topic you know much more about it than I do, but shooting up a bunch of bad guys as we saw it and then then, then leaving those villages left behind, um, what choice do they have? You know, we've maybe taken away their opium crop, so there's no more poppies, but they're in debt to, uh, to the, the, the uh, cartels that um, buy their stuff. What do we do now? What do they do? They don't have, don't have any good choices. We've left. We're not coming back. Or we're not going to come back quickly enough. So somebody turns up with guns. 
they're going to have to be polite and, and compliant. Um, mm -hmm. so we constantly fail to think through those things, um, you know, all sorts of basic problems like imposing a very centrist, you know, um, uh, system of military command and, and governance out of Kabul rather than working in a more federal way in a very um, disparate, complex country with poor roads and, and, mm. and, and a lot of separate communities. So it's not that um, military means couldn't have done much more good in Afghanistan. They could have. They did quite a lot of good along with the bad. It's just mm. that we were not really thinking about the strategic end state, what, what we wanted to get to. And that was the same mistake made with Iraq and Syria, same mistake made with Libya. We haven't thought through the big picture. And so we've become preoccupied on the immediate. Mm. And that's led to lack of good strategic outcomes. I mean, it's not just military leaders, it's all the political leaders that, of course, that are part of this. And political leaders are thinking in terms of three, four-year election cycles and popularity and focus groups and, you know, evening news. So it's it's a wicked problem to get right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it, it, and again, it just pours fuel onto those push-pull personal factors that ultimately, you know, makes the problem, well, well worse. We become part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Okay, so apart from military solutions, uh, to maybe turn into some positives, what else can we do to prevent and counter violent extremism? Well, the first thing is what we've been talking about, understanding what takes people in, the social mm -hmm. forces, the, the personal factors. Um, but how do, but I, guess how, I guess the question is, how do we do that on a, on a, on a, on a, on a kind of macro level? Because if we're you know, looking at engaging uh, with you know, foreign nations, so, so how could we have done that, say, in a place like Afghanistan? Um, okay, well, I mean, it's probably good to think in terms of concrete examples. So mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, uh, if we accept there's a case for a military intervention, I think that you can, you can certainly make that case, then reckon, you know, thinking through, okay, the problem is Al-Qaeda, but they're being hosted by the Taliban. Can we drive a wedge between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban? Can we find some sort of agreement with the Taliban when they're weak um, mm -hmm. so that we can put other alternative systems in place? What system of government is going to be sustainable in, in terms of structures, but also in terms of financial flows? We, you know, we need to think about we need to, and this is a, a weakness in military terms, is to think about playing the long game. Um, mm. we, we, need to, we need to think in terms of decades, not 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 months and not mm. years. And then I think the big lesson is: do we need to use military methods here, or are there other alternatives? So, a more positive example at the moment is is the west of Mindanao um, mm -hmm. and the islands to the west of uh, of the, the large southern island of Mindanao. So there's been various negotiation cycles, first with the Moro National Liberation Front, then the splinter group that came away from it, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. Now, more recently, um, groups like uh, Abu Sayyaf group back in 2014 swore allegiance to uh, to Islamic State. And they were part of a group led by a local presence called the, the Malte Brothers, who led a siege in the largest Muslim city, Marawi. The Philippines military, um, the armed forces of the Philippines, stopped that siege after five months by literally blowing the city to pieces. So a city of 250,000 people was physically destroyed uh, with artillery rounds and, and airstrikes um, and thousands of lives lost and still many people displaced. But to go back to the, the argument for this being um, not entirely negative, persistence with the um, peace and political negotiations with the Bangsamoro and the establishment of a, of a now a transitional Bangsamoro uh, autonomous government in, in Muslim Mindanao is the beginning of getting things right because the problem there is framed particularly in terms of large-scale grievance and insurgency, so we need to address it in those terms. The next thing would be to pick up the, the pieces that have been dropped um, for the previous government on the other big terrorist threat in, mm. in the Philippines, which is the New People's Army, uh, which is all over the country and is a, is a Maoist group uh, driven by economic grievance. And, and, you know, I've heard, I've heard uh, Filipino leaders say, well, when you look at the NPA, you realize most of their claims, I mean, for example, the Supreme Court in the Philippines was asked to declare the New People's Army a terrorist group. And it said, actually, no, we've looked at what they want. Mm. And these are mostly things that we agree as the Philippine state are good things. It's just a mm. question, of, question of methods. Now, that um, will make some people angry. But my point is, if we can work out a negotiated way of getting structural change, we will never make everyone happier. There will always mm. be a splinter group that will go back to the mountains, back to the, to the forests and, and carry on the fight. But in time, that splinter group, you know, the real IRA or the ETA breakaway faction will become less and less powerful. And, and the main body, of mm. course, which involves, you know, we talked about social networks, it involves a group of people generally led by men who are now getting rather old and tired 
don't want to be running through the forest anymore, can't do it. Um, a, a broader community that says we're sick of uh, sick of the troubles in Ireland or sick of the troubles in Mindanao. We, we just want to get back to peace. Mm. There is a, a a potential for a real breakthrough, and and that's that's uh, where the real opportunities come to take an existential threat into something down to a level where it can be controlled by police. But even then, with the policing piece, it still depends on uh, relationships of trust with communities that are affected, trying to prevent people being recruited and radicalised. When you've jailed somebody and they're coming up to their jail sentence, um, preferably whilst in jail, certainly when they go out, mm. work with them to try and rehabilitate them. You won't get perfect success, but you'll get some success. And to the extent you can break the cycle of um, radicalization then you begin to bring down the level of the problem over time. Uh, and, and unless you do this, um, you know, the Israelis have a rather dark expression uh, about counterterrorism in certain contexts for them called mowing the grass. Mm. Well, you know, as I said, it's a dark expression, but it suggests that there's nothing to be done but just this regular sort of maintenance. Um, <laughs> there's some truth in that, but of course, you really want to get to a point where the sort of police use of violence is really minimal because your community relationships piece, your addressing the underlying grievances piece, your stopping um, recruitment piece is working so well that it's a very small number of people who are drawn to groups, mm. and that you know that has been the case um, lately in, in in many democracies with respect to Islamist groups. They're mm. they're really on the back foot. That's why they're so active in Africa and other places where mm. you've got conflict zones. But we have another problem now in the far right, which is actually growing apace uh, in a very scary fashion. And I do want to touch on the far right, but I just uh, because I know you're you're really an expert in in Indonesia, uh, and you've made the point that we've made some inroads. I suspect you're talking about Indonesia. So, what have been some of the successes, and why has Indonesia been so successful? Well, there's there's a number of elements to it. One is that you know I mentioned um, uh, in, in passing that uh, Suharto had stepped down abruptly in in uh, May of ninety ninety eight. Um, there'd been a financial crisis in ninety seven that uh, impacted really badly on Indonesia, particularly the banking sector. You know, there was rampant mm, uh, mm -hmm. inflation, the exchange rate dropped. Suharto tried to form a new government for a second time in May and no one wanted to join him, basically. Mm, mm. His secretary famously said when asked, OK, who do we have for the new cabinet? He said, well, there's, there's, there's you and there's me and um, so far that's all there is. Uh, <laughs> so he stepped down. Um, uh, and the next year there were elections, fairly free and fair. Uh, Abdurrahman Wahid was chosen as a president. He, he had a very reformist agenda. The interim president who had replaced um, uh, Suharto, B.J. Habibi, um, uh, who was vice president but stepped in constitutionally to become president, mm -hmm. Suharto had told him, I'm stepping down tomorrow, by which he meant in sort of Javanese cultural terms, we're stepping down. Uh, Habibi mm. didn't get the message. <laughs> and he said, okay, I'll, I'll take over. Um, Suharto never spoke to him again, um, which was tough oh, wow. for him. Mm. But he carried on freeing political prisoners, for opening up the press, laying the foundations for uh, elections. So those two transitional presidents made a big difference. The presidents since um, have done a series of good things, mixed story, but we've had peaceful uh, and fairly fair and open elections on a regular cycle. So it's become a success story, not perfect. It's still a mm -hmm. work in, in progress. Yeah. Uh, and that has been a better framework for counterterrorism, having a, a, a stable democracy. It's not the only measure because you can get levels of good governance and behavior without democracy, but democracy is a better way to do it. And then the Bali bombing I mentioned, um, it was a wake-up call because there had been acts of violence. There'd been some insurgent violence in Ambon and central Sulawesi. There'd been various bombs, a bomb on a stock exchange, a, a mm. bomb attack on the Philippines ambassador, a series of coordinated bombs on Christmas Eve in 2000. People blamed it on elements of the elite, the, the military. Um, when the Bali bomb went off October 12, 2002, they said, well, it must be either either it's the military doing playing games for politics or it's the Americans, the Israelis, whatever it is. Mm, mm, um, mm. It couldn't be in just ordinary Indonesian guys doing this. Yeah. Um, it was a post-blast forensics that led to identifying uh, where the vehicle had come from and had been used in the Denpasar you know, minibus circuit. And that led, led it, you know, been sold through a dozen owners, but it led to Amrozi, the last owner. He was arrested along with his his fellows. These were a splinter element of Jama Islamia. And then it was clear, this is what you had. You had an uh, Al-Qaeda-style network in Indonesia mm -hmm. uh, linked to Al-Qaeda, but local uh, Jama Islamia or at least the splinter group that had broken away from the main group, impatient, wanted to carry on with bombings. And then uh, that 
cooperation forensically um, relied heavily on the Australian Federal Police because of prior relations. Uh, I don't know that it would have had the same breakthrough. It was an Indonesian officer who made the, the breakthrough in Indonesian forensic investigators, but the relationship enabled them to address a weakness they had. They didn't have experience in post-blast forensics. Mm, mm, mm. They set up a, a, a section um, of the uh, National Police Academy. Um, uh, it was called the Jakarta Centre for Law Enforcement Cooperation, but it was in the academy in Samarang in uh, central Java, and it was really about counterterrorism. Mm -hmm. But that's that trained lots of Indonesians. It also trained lots of other Southeast Asians. Uh, it's been a great success. Uh, and this special counterterrorism detachment that was established as well, and it is now probably one of the most successful um, counterterrorism uh, groups any, anywhere in the world. It's arrested 2,000 plus people, mm. and it is now um, able to hold uh, and, and sustain um, threats from Jama Islamia, which have decided to play the long game and be less aggressive, and Islamic State, which has found it can't organize large-scale attacks reliably, so it often targets individual police stations and, and you know, small-scale lone actor attacks. It's contained that problem, um, mm -hmm. but it, both the international cooperation that allowed the Indonesian police to transition to get those skills, and it was um, a, a framework of open society post Suharto, a, a reasonably stable, reasonably open democracy, those things have come together in the world's largest Muslim nation, a nation of 280 million people. And it, had they not come together, things could be very much worse. And mm. you only have to look at another large a nation, Nigeria, to see how, you know, when you have constant failure, the door is left open for, uh, for terrorist and insurgent groups. And when you don't have institutional commitment to addressing those push pull personal factors i guess uh, again just to visually draw it because i mean that, what you're right. describing there it, it's basically institutions and they you know reducing the likelihood uh, of certain vulnerabilities existing within within individuals which then can be used to either push them pull them or create personal reasons for lone wolf attack or something like that uh, yeah. and again that's a that's that's a critical important piece as to as to why why governance is so important. This is not to say that we can't have better governance, but this is one of one of the biggest arguments I've had with uh, with people who, uh, you know, are COVID deniers, vaccine deniers, who basically blame the government uh, and it's about down with the government, uh, etc. Sure, what we're discussing is improving governance, not absence of governance, because absence of governance is anarchy, and uh, you know, I'm sure most people who actually deeply think about that, uh, wouldn't want it. Uh, but just a final point that I want to tap into, and that is this uh, growing threat of far-right violence. How real is that threat in the West? It, it varies according to context. So it's the number one terrorism problem in the United States of America, regardless mm. of whether local law allows easy prosecution on terrorism charges. Mm. These 300-plus militia, like the Proud Boys, are one part of the problem. You then have, uh, and this is different from Islamic State and Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. a, a much more loosely diffuse um, network of networks. So in Australia, we would have said, okay, one day it's going to be our problem, but think heavens, it's not our problem just yet. Mm -hmm. And then in March um, 2019, we had this awful Christchurch attack. Mm -hmm. Now, it was Christchurch, New Zealand, but it was an Australian terrorist, one, one, in, mm -hmm. one Australian uh, who had purchased a couple of AR-15 uh, military assault rifles or the civilian equivalent, mm -hmm, effectively, mm -hmm. and uh, prepared himself and gone in and shot people in, in, in prayer and cold blood, killed 51 and, and uh, injured oh. almost as many. And streamed it live. Uh, and streamed it live yeah, and, and, and yeah. uploaded a manifesto and is mm -hmm. regarded as a saint, as a hero. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. He followed on the example for him of Anders Bering Breivik in Norway in July mm -hmm. 2011 and people before that. But in, in recent years, this has increased in tempo and people have copied particularly um, the, the Christchurch um, shooters manifesto. So now it, it's, a, it's a problem in our part of the world, in, in Australia, um, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to take responsibility it's, it goes to show that for all I talk about the effectiveness of police counterterrorism intelligence, and that's true um, in, in, in Australia, authorities say ASIO, our national domestic mm. intelligence agency, Australian federal police and state police say that six, seven years ago, far right terrorist threats took up about 10% of their caseload. Mm. Now it's, it's half their caseload. Oh, wow. It's risen wow. You know, steeply over the last half dozen years. Wow. Uh, and the overall counterterrorism caseload is, is not diminished. You know, it's, it's, it's not like that it's becoming a lesser problem. Um, it's, the and and have they been able to kind of come to any consensus as to, as to why? What's motivating this? I mean, that's a pretty significant increase. 
Yeah, it, it is. Um, it's it's because it's you know we are globalized. Going back to our social media discussion, mm-hmm. connected. So so uh, Tarrant, the Christchurch shooter, um, wasn't part of any particular one group in Australia. Though he had some affiliation, his audience, people he he, he was live streaming to be watched by and, and adored by, were in in Eastern and Western Europe. They were in North America. They were in Australia and Britain. And it means that if you've got a growing problem in Europe, as, as we do have, and, and of course there's a history of, of, of fascism and, and now neo-fascism, mm-hmm. um, if you've got a growing problem in America and you've got this deeper problem in terms of history of large-scale slavery, civil war fought on that basis, but then incomplete solutions afterwards to a large extent pl- recent political forces play on racism that goes back mm-hmm. to those structural problems, mm-hmm. that's conducive, but then... The extent that it's conducive in America it doesn't stay in America. You know, it comes to Australia um, via our, our digital sort of highways and mm, um, mm. and feedback loops. So, if we were just looking at Australia, we, we might say not a problem. But I think in this digital age, it, it comes much more quickly, and Australians like to consider themselves as avid travellers, getting back mm. to travelling now post COVID, mm. and uh, avid consumers of, of new ideas. And that that positive aspect of Australian society now becomes a liability. Uh, globally, I think the rise of the far right has to do with the rise of a, a different but related thing, which is authoritarian populism. So uh, a populist leader says, I'm going to go to Washington, to Canberra, to to Westminster. I'm going to change the system because if I'm from outside the system and this elite that runs the system is screwing you. So I'm, I'm going, going to drain to, the swamp. Uh, that. <laughs> Donald Trump's I'm going to jain, uh, drain the swamp. I mean... Mm. Uh, of Donald Tr- Trump has spent his life wallowing in a swamp, mm. uh, devouring any any um, uh, any uh, weaker passerby uh, mm. with you know, with dodgy business practices. But still, the rhetoric stuck because people wanted to believe that somebody could change Washington, and so he became a populist leader. He's not a far right leader in that s- literal, you know, mm. direct sense. You, you can make connections. Many of the people travelling around him, like Steve Bannon, his yeah. advisor, you know, certainly far right. Uh, but because he's a narcissist focused on his own personal power and success, uh, and he has other narcissists like Rupert Murdoch, you know, uh, for different motivations, um, but narcissism is a, a factor mm. amplifying the message, uh, that leads the space of something else bad happening. Now, something else bad happening is genuine um, far right violent extremists and, and, mm. and genuine fascists. Mm. Mm. I don't believe that Rupert Murdoch uh, and Fox News is is you know he's not a fascist, but he's he's playing with fire. Well, they're business people, right? They're they're business. exploiting incentives. Yeah, Rupert Murdoch doesn't need more money, so the question is motivation. And I can only speculate that he gets off on the fact that he's more powerful than the president, more powerful than the prime mm. minister. Mm. So that's a kind mm. of corruption, but it's not corruption with money. It's corruption <laughs> with you know intention. Mm. He could have used his powers for great good. He's used them, unfortunately, for. You know, it wasn't a lot of harm. So these these factors come together. My point being, not that the populists uh, explain the far right uh, and the violent far right, the the, the extreme far right that is uh, in, involved in violent extremism, but they open up the space. So in America, uh, elements on the on the extreme far right would say, I don't know whether Donald Trump is for us. I mean, whether he's one of us or not, but I do know that he's been good for us. Mm. And the number of of uh, far right uh, violent extremist attacks uh, and incidents through the Trump years doubled roughly. Hmm. So it was it was rising before him. He was not the sole cause, but it certainly doubled during his his uh, presidency. So the fact we've now got uh, we're about to have a new uh, prime minister in Italy with far right associations. Mm. Mm. Uh, first time since Mussolini, who was first uh, um, came to power a hundred years ago. Mm. That's disturbing because it opens up. It doesn't automatically determine that bad things will happen in a terrorist front, but it certainly makes it more likely that will happen. It sets the conditions for, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I guess one of the other really the things that really struck me reading some of your work, and I can't remember if it was the book or in, in, in one of your papers, but that military experience exclusively appears as a predictor of far right extremism. That to me was a really, really interesting uh, finding through your research. Because what we're saying is that, you know, one, it's not only that it's extremist ideology, uh, it's not ex- only that they're going to be loud and dangerous, but arguably many of those on the far right spectrum will have military experience, which, of course, makes the threat potentially exponentially higher. Is that right? Yeah, it's a complicating factor. Uh, mm-hmm. In America, uh, and these are figures that I've got from memory, so I'm not 
completely mm-hmm. shot by mm-hmm. the right, yeah. but, yeah, but yeah. roughly a third of serving police officers, and there are hundreds of police forces in America. That's part of the, the challenge and part of the mm-hmm. problem, state troopers and, and local police and municipal police. But a third of police officers are former military or military veterans. Wow. Okay. Now, that's wow. not necessarily, I'm, mm. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing in itself. No. You need no. to find a, a, a career and, and, and do some good. And some of them do great good. Absolutely. Yeah. But but for others, if they're carrying trauma, and most of exactly. them are carrying some degree of trauma, exactly. yeah. and, and the system doesn't treat military veterans well, you can end up homeless. I mean, your relationship breaks up, your wife kicks you out, you lose the house, you're on the street. Things go bad pretty quickly. You self-medicate. It's 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 miserable stuff. Yeah. But if some of these guys end up serving in police forces, and the police forces have received you know several billion dollars worth of military equipment over the last twenty years, mm. because it sort of it's a flow-on effect. If you've got a riot in your city, you probably don't want to be turning up at an armored personnel carrier. But if you've got one, it's very tempting to wheel it out. Mm, 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 and uh, and uh, well, know, and if the other side has got AK forty sevens or you know some serious uh, firepower. Or to be fair, they, they won't be AK-47s. They will be American-made uh, rifles, uh, probably exactly. AR-15s. Yeah, that's right, um, my bad, you, exactly. Yeah, you yeah. can buy them, go down the street and buy them. You don't have to go to the, exactly the, right. yeah. the various black market. But, yeah, to be fair to police, you're pulling somebody over on a highway stop. They probably won't pull a, a, an AR-15 on you, but when they're going to the glove box, they may be getting their license, but they may, may be pulling out a Glock. And mm. lots of police officers are killed every week on, on that basis. Mm, mm. That's it's just a, such a tragic, sad problem. So... When you up the scale of things, guys carrying trauma, equipped with military-style weapons, up against people who have military-style weapons, then, I mean, there's been some really good work done. Um, For example, in Seattle, after the Black Lives Matter protests erupted into Seattle, the police force was caught by surprise. They regained their balance. They Mm. recognized that one thing they were doing really badly was communicating poorly. Mm. And they got their communications working better. They built lines of trust with many of the protesters, many of whom had very legitimate grievances. The Black Lives Matter protesters in general Mm. were, the police say, open to um, communication and and following orders and instructions. You know, please don't do this, avoid Mm. this area, don't do these things. It was the sort of the the anarchist element and some of the far right element that snuck in that was the bigger problem. But, you know, they managed to get things under control, not by using military methods and military uh, equipment, but by doing the old school policing thing of building relationships Mm -hmm. and trust. But on the other side, we don't know how many of the militia groups uh, have military vets, but we do know that they figure. Also, uh, an insidious problem is that serving police officers and serving military personnel uh, get drawn into these movements. Um, You know, you've been in military bases in Iraq I can bet you uh, I know the TV station that was playing 24-7 in, mm. in the mess hall, right? Mm, mm, and yeah, uh, right. Yeah. just and, it's, and Fox News has gotten worse over, over the decades. Now, mm. in itself, that's not going to radicalize people, but it predisposes them to a kind of jaundiced view that's of right. certain elements of government. They're more likely to go into their Facebook group and consume even worse stuff. It's, you know, it's not a good, healthy situation. Mm. And again, it contributes to those simplistic narratives, right? That, yes, uh, yeah. that explain things as black and white. And especially if you've got experience and if you're viewing your own experience in a country like Iraq or Afghanistan through a simplistic prism, yeah. simplistic lens, then you've got all the more argument and potentially all the more credibility within those groups to absolutely validate uh, those simple narratives as true, uh, which then, of course, increases your status, increases your sense of belonging, uh, etc., within that group, and, uh, and of course, the cycle continues. Uh, yeah, this was, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry just, just, just to uh, explain what I mean when I talk about mm-hmm. Murdoch and, and Fox News, mm-hmm. I'm not saying everyone is bad all the time. It's normally commentators rather than journalists that are the problem. But mm-hmm. when Carlson um, Tucker night after night repeats Russian propaganda, pro-Kremlin, pro-Putin propaganda during the middle of the war in Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you've got a problem. Mm. And if people marinate in that sort of toxic set of narratives, then they're, they're, it's weakening their defences when they go on to Facebook and other things. So yeah. that's... I mean, it's it's really interesting you made that point about that kind of cognitive or, or mental immunity. I interviewed Andy Norman, who who published a book called Mental Immunity, uh, and explained that very point in in some finer detail. It's it's absolutely it's scary. Uh, but maybe my uh, and, and this again, this wasn't really this was slightly off script on the US. But uh, the US, I think last year or the year before, featured for the first time or almost was about to feature in the top ten conflicts to watch by the Crisis Group International. I think it was you know coming in a close eleventh. What do you think? Where is the U.S. now, in your view? And and I'm and I'm asking this question because what happens in the U.S. matters, uh, as it's the 
well, it's the leader of the free world, right? It's the beacon of democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so what are, you, what are you seeing is, uh, uh, as happening in the US over the next year or two? Well, the US, I mean, it's easy to say of so many countries and certainly of the US that it's at a crossroads, but it certainly is at a crossroads point, not for the first time and not for the last time. But, um, you know, long story short, US society needs uh, democracy to function well, needs checks and balances. Uh, so it needs two strong, healthy parties Democrats aren't perfect. Um, they may well lose balance of power in, the, in, in Congress in the midterms in November. Uh, that's something to watch. President Biden, I think objectively, has done a lot of good things, not perfectly. I'm critical of his sudden mm. withdrawal from Afghanistan, for mm. example. Mm -hmm. But his popularity ratings don't reflect what he's doing. And so, you know, the, that party is vulnerable. On the other side, the, uh, the GOP, the Republican Party, has been hollowed out by what began as the Tea Party movement. It actually goes back well before mm. that. But... Um, uh, manifested with Trump. Um, you have people taken hostage to Trump. They dare not run for office, even in the pre-selection, uh, and go against Trump. Otherwise, he'll pour his resources into making sure they don't get pre-selected, mm. much mm. less win office. We mm. saw that with Liz Cheney, for example. So mm. it, it, unless the GOP recovers you know, its, its original position as a classic conservative party, more or less, unless it gets some health back, uh, if it's controlled by sort of bullies with a narrative that's extremely toxic and, and um, politically extreme, American democracy is going to suffer whether or not, um, it, it may be that the over, overturning of Roe v. Wade, the, the Dodd decision actually means that the midterms don't go the way mm. of uh, the Republicans. Normally the, the government in the White House does badly in midterms. That's the way it, it, it historically plays out. Mm -hmm. As in you think that might be a sufficiently motivating factor to get uh, many more Democrats out to, to this is the uh, abortion laws. Uh, Obviously, it's not compulsory yeah. voting. So, yes, mm. whether people actually turn up and vote is a critical factor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, it, it might be, we'll have to wait and see with the midterms, whether that means that the Republicans don't make the gains they would have otherwise made mm. without the mm. sort of reckless grab for um, intrusion into people's lives in, in really consequential ways. But either way, the Republican Party needs to get back to being beyond the party of Trump or of whom Trump appoints mm. and to being back to a, you know, a broad church that's mm. essentially centre-right rather than edging towards being, in many respects, far-right. Uh, mm. If that doesn't happen, American democracy is not going to re recover and in time, you know, worse things will happen. Um, yeah. I'm not saying it's hopeless, but it's it's dire at the moment. It's dire, yeah. And, 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 and I guess the problem is that we're also hearing more and more terms like civil war bandied around when we're talking about America. Uh, and I guess even that, the fact that we're even saying that in itself shows how dire the situation is. Now, of course, as you said, it's not certain that it's going to happen, but there are absolutely risks uh, of that occurring. Uh, Greg, my last question to you. What are your biggest fears for this decade? Look, my, my biggest fears go back to this last thing we're talking about, the, the breakdown of democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think the biggest challenge we face collectively as a, as a human race is climate change because you know, we've got a rather overloaded planet. Population curve will, will trend down over the course of this century, but um, places like Africa can't afford any more stress right now feeding people. Nigeria is growing at a rate of knots, um, which is not a bad thing in itself, but, but you know, if you don't have um, youth given decent employment, no point in graduating from university if you don't get uh, some, something that's a reasonable job. And then with pressure from climate change, you're going to see more troubles um, with political violence. But the the immediate, I, I do believe that we will make this adjustment with climate change. We'll overshoot, we'll do too little too late, but then eventually make good and begin to um, learn to live with a, a, um, a hotter planet, but, a, but, but, but do the things we need to do. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of moderately optimistic we'll get there eventually. But the real game changer is in this very stressed context, what happens to democracy. And mm. once again, I, I'm not fundamentally pessimistic saying American democracy is going to fail. Um, but America is particularly vulnerable at the moment. And um, the rise of far right parties and leaders in Europe is another point of vulnerability. But America is the big one to watch. If America mm. can course correct and regain its balance, then the planet has reason to be encouraged. If it mm. doesn't, so much else follows on directly and indirectly from that. So that is, that's the biggest concern at the moment for me. Yeah. On that uh, somewhat, uh, well, hopeful, but also uh, realistic note, I think. Greg, I want to thank you. This has been absolutely fascinating. I knew it would be. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, we've planned this for, for some time now, but uh, I feel like there's another four podcasts in this with all the various threads uh, that we've left unpicked. Uh, but I really do want to thank you for your time. It's been uh, fascinating. Thank you very much. Great. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much, Maz.
Thank you for listening to another episode of The Voices of War. And since you got this far, please take a moment to like and review the show wherever you get your pods. Thank you, and until the next time.